Welcome to Money on Tap. Money on Tap, your personal finance headquarters, where we bring out the professionals' experience and some fun in what we call three-dimensional investing, utilizing insurance, brokerage, and fee-based planning. That's what we do on this show. We look at all sides of the issues, and we bring a fully independent planning perspective to the table. Thanks for joining us for Money on Tap with Seth Cressman and Ben Brayshaw. Today, we're going to bring you some highlights from our previous Money on Tap shows, some of the very best of what you need to know when you're talking about money, about your money. In our first segment, Seth and Ben discuss rules you can make and rules you can break when it comes to your retirement planning. We're going to start making rules right out of the gate because, you, you, I mean, you got to have the rules in order to break them, right? I think you're right, Seth. I mean, we, we fooled around with that, but I think honestly, yeah. Let's talk about what what the foundational pieces are. We always talk about foundations. What's the where do you start? And we got, I mean, there's a thousand rules I could come up with. I probably, but we came up with four and four, four rules to make, and I got four rules we can break. And I love breaking rules. For starters, we're gonna make a plan and we're gonna stick to it. Uh, you know, we really within this kind of we tuck in this idea of investing with intention. And, and it, what we're looking to try to accomplish here is just some parameters. We're going to give ourselves some bumpers to uh, make sure that we get down to those pins and we knock them all over. If you've ever done any, any bowling with those bumpers. Uh, but when we, what we, <laughs> <laughs> when we shift in any of these things, it's intentional. It's with thought. And we really are, are only trying to make these shifts when we're, when we're, we're running it by a professional. Because, uh, you know, we could come up with a new plan every day if that's what we're doing. And really, that's a it's not going to allow you to get there and to accomplish the goals that you've set out and and work within, you know, the parameters of, you know, returns within a market or the tools that we're using to try to create usually income within that in living within a budget is, you know, potentially part of what that looks like for you. Yeah, you know, Seth, I, I like that Andy Stanley. Um, it's a it's a Bible study I did years and years ago. That it's called guardrails, and I love the idea of the the, the visual of you know the car going down the road. and You got these guardrails on both sides. You never intend to hit the guardrail, but the guardrail Ooh. is there to protect you. It's it's like it's the bumper car, right? It's the uh-huh. it's that thing. You, you never want to hit it, but it's there if you need it. Same idea of you bowling. I mean, uh, bowling is a good example too, right? You got those, those those rails going down so you don't go into the gutter. It's the same concept. And, um, you know, making a plan is the guardrails. You know, we hope not to have the bad scenario of the plan. You know, it'd be great if we had the good scenario. You're probably not going to be on either side of those guardrails with a good planner. But you have the guardrails. Because you can't plan for every contingency, but there's things you can do to make retirement strong and be what you want. I mean, there's just so many pieces we're going to get into here. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you, you know, those guardrails are really important, and that's why we say make a plan. Because if you don't have a plan, you don't even know if you hit a guardrail yet. You know, I'm reminded actually of that Fidelity commercial. Uh, we just talked about Fidelity quite a bit, but uh, it's the commercial where it's the couple that comes in and sits down, and you know their son-in-law and daughter are moving into the city, and so they're you know, they have a grandchild, and they say plans change, and I think that's kind of the tagline that they've got there, and I I think that's a really interesting concept and one that we work with all the time. I think what we're trying to say here is not that you know, life doesn't happen and that we're, we don't have the ability to shift the direction that we're going. I mean, great, the pandemic. I mean, one of the reasons we're doing this show is really because we're going to break some rules that have been pretty hard and fast in the industry. But post-pandemic, we've just learned so much about being versatile, being nimble, being able to change plans. But the the point I think is here is if, like, for instance, you have your um, 
your Google Maps or your Apple Maps or wherever you're going. And you can see the fastest route that it's going to take you. But sometimes there's an obstruction. There's something happening down the road you can't see, you're not aware of. And that's where in the planning world, we come alongside you and say, hey, we're going to go ahead and we're going to get off at this next exit. We're going to do a little detour here. And then we're going to, you know, I don't know, see some countryside and we're going to get it back on track. Ultimately, we're going to get you where you want to go. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I, I think in this kind of number two tandems into this a little bit, and it might be some crossover, but, you know, maintaining a disciplined investment approach, you know, some people would call this asset allocation, you know, focusing on your asset allocation, maintaining that, you know, maybe you're 60, 40, but, you know, people say, hey, listen, you know, you want to own a certain amount of equities and bonds, take your age, subtract, you know, that, and that's the percentage of bonds you should own. As you get older, your bond allocation should get bigger and, you know, and, and own less stocks, you know, but maybe, maybe the market's not the way you're, you know, you know, bonds have really taken a hit. We've talked about that on the show multiple times. The yields are lower. People are concerned about inflation. And if rates go up, you know, the bonds you buy today will be worth less tomorrow. You know, there's all those concerns, but maybe you are looking to dislocate from that traditional you know, traditional asset allocation model. Maybe, maybe you have a new version of an asset allocation model, but whatever it is, make it a disciplined approach, understand the pros and cons. Maybe you want to take on more risk. Maybe you want to own stocks instead of bonds on a, you know, maybe you're going to say, I'm going to take my age 150 and subtract it or something. I don't know. But whatever that is, if you're, especially if you're going to dislocate from a standard, um, do that with a professional. That's not something to fool around and say, oh, I just think this works. Um, and, and don't jump around. That's why I always tell people, I always think of that song, jump around, jump around. You know, like, I'm not going to sing it for anybody, but I think about that. And it's like, people are, it's like this, you know, I've seen it like on TV. I don't know what Coke commercial, I don't know who does it. But, and you see the, everyone's jumping with, it looks meaningless. It has no real design. It's not, you know, you're just jumping to jump, you know, and, and people do that. And that's a really costly and usually very um, poor investor outcome scenario. So I always tell people maintain a disciplined approach. And if you have to adjust, adjust the sales, you're still sailing in the same direction, but maybe the wind changes and that's where the adjustment comes. So a little bit of history here. If we, if we, why are we saying these are things that um, uh, we need to stick with or we're going to go ahead and break. Uh, if you take a look at how long some of these rules have been around, I mean, this is this goes back to before ETFs. Uh, mutual funds were not very common. You know, people had just stocks, stocks and bonds. And that was what they were buying these individual things or you know, equities or bonds with and equities, we mean stocks or, but now that could be a mutual fund. That could be an ETF. It could be all these different things to create that side of the equity portfolio. And it's been around for a long, long time. So what has changed in the, in the industry, Ben mentioned yield, which was, you know, predominantly where uh, people would go for distributions and income. And the idea here was that, uh, the, you know, the math around this was we're going to have a more volatile, more equity portfolio. The younger you are moving towards that bond uh, uh, side being greater as you get closer to income needs and retirement. And what that would do would stabilize, stabilize that portfolio and create more income. And the I, it, we're still saying here, this is really critical for you to not get way over your skis and just be, you know, holding on for dear life with an equity portfolio in retirement and trying to figure out how to create income from that. On the other side of that, you can't have too much in the, in, in the side of like that bond side where you're just not generating enough for you to live on. And, um, and so it's really understanding what is the right balance and there's ways to, to craft that income outside of the traditional equity bond side that ultimately can bring a greater enhancement to your retirement income and some of these strategies that are uh, more long-term that you can participate in to ultimately not outlive the assets that you've created to, to, to move through retirement. 
No, that's, that's well said, Seth. That's well said. You know, I, I think number three, and this is a rule to keep forever, um, don't take lump sum distributions from retirement. That, that is probably the worst way to access money. Um, lump sum distributions just create a almost invariably bad scenario in your portfolio. And I, I see this happen. It's like the market's always down when people do lump sum distributions. And that compounded loss just kills them. And, it, and we use that analogy where, you know, if you have 100% of your money and you take out, you know, you know, if the market goes down 10%, you know, you're down to 90% of your money. And then, then you take out 10%, you take out, you know, 9% at that point at 90%, you're down to 81% of your money. Now, mathematically, it's about 24% to get back to square one. Now, you have to outperform this 10% loss in the market with a 24% return. I mean, it's it's really... Well, that just doesn't make any sense, though. No, I, know. I mean, I take a 10% loss, I should only have to take a, you know, get 10% to be back uh, in the game, right? right? Why 24%? Yeah, it doesn't work that way. That's the way the math works. So, you know, I mean, I think the thing is, is that lump sum distributions create that. We always encourage people to build a, build a cost analysis of all of your expenses, break it down, figure out what it is monthly. Even if you pay something annually, I encourage people to take it out monthly. It's called dollar cost averaging. Most people use that as an investment style to invest into, but it should also be a take out of. And people who do these lump sums almost invariably get hit hard at at a particular time. Like if you take your money out every end of March, April, second quarter, and you did that last year during COVID, you know, market was down 36% at one point. That's a huge hammering. You're listening to the best of Money on Tap. And in this next conversation, Ben and Seth look at how different personality types view money and in turn affects how money is invested. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. We are talking about personality types. There are several personality types when it comes to working with money, and it's not all bad, but it's one of those things that we find really interesting when kind of working in behavioral finance and trying to understand why do people do with it with their money? Well, uh, you know, do Seth, what they do with their money. You know, you, you say that, and just what comes to mind, and I, mean, I think about the fact that the behavioral piece of this is something that we have to help people through. Like, because yeah. whether you're a saver or, you know, a spender or a worrier, you know, all the different, you know, we have to work with that person because we have to get them to a point where they can get to a healthy point. And that's, you know, and uh, sorry, I just, as you're saying the behavior of finance, that's a great point. Yeah. So uh, what kind of a personality are you would be, I guess, what, what Ben's talking about there and trying to apply that and understand it in our personal journey with, uh, with finance. We all have a relationship with money. Um, and we're going to, we're going to have some of these traits that are going to be more prevalent than others. Yeah, that's for sure. And I think, I think the thing that is the most interesting when we meet with clients is the combination of the personality traits when someone comes in, right? You have a husband and wife and one person thinks one way about money and one person thinks almost completely opposite. It's either almost agnostic or completely in the, like, oh, he takes too much risk or, you know, she doesn't let me do what I need to do. And, you know, I like, well, I, you know, I do all the work. I don't handle any of it. Oh, they, they don't want to even come in. They don't even talk. They don't even like even thinking about money. It's not their thing. I mean, I can name a thousand different phrases out there that represent any one of a zillion. I mean, we have eight personality types today to talk about. And I think, you know, if you're listening to this show, you say, well, you know, I, I kind of know I'm this or I'm that. But I think, that, I think the benefit you're going to get out of this is to understand when to combat the natural inclination of the personality type you're kind of born with or you've learned or you've acquired to get yourself to a better balance, right? I mean, we all have inclinations to do one thing or another. And finding that median is really important So, because when you approach money and you approach financial decisions and so forth. It like Dan said, it's an emotional decision. Everything is emotional around this. So if you can understand all the personality types and start challenging yourself to become balanced and to make sure you're not drifting into one versus the other too much. I think it's it's probably most important and we see it every day with clients is you know for you out there as an investor to understand what your personality type is. When when the topic of money and investing comes up, 
you know, what's that initial gut reaction like? And just so you know, the importance and understanding in that is so you don't create roadblocks for yourself. You're not creating blind spots that you're, you're able to keep an open mind to the, the conversation ahead of you, understanding that when certain topics and thoughts come up, that you're going to have a natural reaction to it because it's, you know, you don't want to have those things stand in the way of making the right decision and creating the best opportunity for yourself down the road. So that little bit of self-awareness and, and comprehension of what's just natural for you to react in terms of making big, very important kind of longer term decisions, you know, trust the guidance that you get from your advisors is what I guess the, the bigger point, you know, make sure that your own personal inclinations don't prevent you from hearing what's being said. Well said, Dan. Um, before we get too far down the road, you can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. And um, if you're listening to us on the radio today, we are a podcast as well. So if you miss something and you want to go back and, and grab that information, find us at uh, Money on Tap on any one of the podcast venues. And we appreciate you listening. And we also, you know, we love the, the call-ins and the, the activity that you guys are creating out there around the, the content that we're trying to deliver here today. So we've got, first and foremost, um, probably one of our favorites to see is a saver. And um, how, do you know, how do you know that you're a saver? Well, you, you might put away money endlessly, uh, sometimes without you know, any kind of a real goal in mind. It's just kind of a, a compulsion to you, you have to save. Uh, you might also be you know, saving money just because it's what makes you feel secure in life. That's usually one of the goals or one of the things that, that's kind of an underlining motivation if you're a, a, a big money saver. Uh, you're probably also very frugal. You might find that friends will come and ask you for you know advice on uh, what phone company is cheapest or where the best deal in town for you know burger this week is. Yeah, you know, Seth, I think as we go through the concept of saver, right, it sounds great. Like if you're listening to this show and you're saying to yourself, I'm a saver, I- I'm the responsible party, I'm the person who's got it under control and I'm putting money away. It's like, that sounds really good. But, you know, as I think about savers, yeah, I mean, we love meeting savers. But if you're a, if you're a compulsive saver, um, you can become really overly too cautious to the point where you actually cost yourself money, where you're, not, you're no longer saving. And, and one of the things we've talked about on the show a number of times is the concept of inflation. Like, it, like in this inflationary environment that we're facing, we're talking about if all you're doing is saving money in the mattress, like we talk about the $46,000 that that guy found in the attic in Massachusetts, it's still only worth $46,000. Exactly right. You know, I mean... It's, it's less now. I mean, compared to what it was then, it was like half a million. Yeah, it was almost a half a million, and today it's worth 46000 That person lost money, but they were a saver, you know? And so mm-hmm. when you think about that, that person never pulled the money... Somebody who put the money up there, half a million. If I put a half a million dollars in my attic and I went through the depression and everything else, and at some point in time I never pulled it out, I became an unhealthy saver. And I think people have to understand there's both healthy and unhealthy in each one of these categories that we're going to probably talk about. Now, maybe not everyone will have a healthy or unhealthy, but. People, you know, say, well, I'm a saver. And that's just like, well, in, in a cultural environment, that just sounds good. Like, oh, you must be responsible. But that's not necessarily the case. And, and in this example, I mean, it's just actually like literally the perfect, you know, money in the news article out there is to say, hey, saving isn't all what it's cracked up to be. You know, I grew up in um, like probably all of us. My, my grandparents survived and went through the Depression. My parents were severely impacted in their growing up by that whole mentality and that kind of uh, experience from the generation before. So saving was critical. I mean, my family very much was into if you, you know have an extra dollar, you put it in the bank. And it was, it was just automatic. It was just what was expected. And, and that's the advice that they'd, they'd gotten through the generations. But later in life, you know, when I was kind of beginning my career in finance, I got this other tidbit that I, I had heard someplace. And I can't even exactly place it, but it was profound. And, uh, you know, I still live and believe, believe it today. Is that you can't save your way to wealth. You can't do it. You cannot possibly save enough. That's you a, have to invest. That's a great line. Can't save your way to wealth. Can't do it. 
Yeah, there are uh, there are several drawbacks to being you know um, unbalanced in this relationship. Um, you know, you might be missing out on uh, hobbies, and you might be passing up on time with your family, taking a vacation, even. You know, if that's the the motivation behind why you're not doing something, it, that there's an unbalance there, and yeah. um, there there is definitely a sacrifice. And whoever I'll buried that forty six thousand, you know, <laughs> they. They they passed up a chance to take a vacation or, or buy that car or do whatever it was, and they died before they told anyone where the money was. Yeah. Number two, uh, well, folks, not the saver, the spender. Um, you're a spender. You probably already know this, and <laughs> you've had other people try to talk you out of making some of these decisions. But um, you know what are the what are the indications that that's you? You you know you're buying just stuff you don't need. Frankly, uh, you've You've got, um, you know, a tendency to probably treat people to a special something just for no particular reason. Um, you know, you might be kind of like an emotional buyer as well. Like if you're, uh, if you're, you know, kind of spending cr- creates a, a satiating type of a of a feeling to alleviate stress for a lot of the more compulsive spenders that we find. Yeah, I think I just identified my first hybrid too. My wife is a bargain shopper for stuff she does not need. <laughs> and she's not a subscriber to our podcast. Um, <laughs> that's, that's why I can get away with that. Then. I, I think that's an interesting piece about that, right? So there is the spender. We all know a spender. And, and, and when we use the word spender, there's that negative connotation too. Are there good spenders? I mean, you, you have to know when to spend and when not to spend, right? Uh, there's a balance of when to save and when not to, when not to save and when to spend, when to invest. And, um, but if you don't have, you know, kind of guardrails inside each of these things where you're saving appropriately, you're spending appropriately, any one of these, any one of these personality traits can really get out of whack. And that's one of the things that I think is, is a complicated issue for most of our listeners. I mean, there's not a person, any of us, I mean, I, I, I know both of you well, I've known both of you for, well, 20, 25 years and, and we all know each other's pitfalls. I mean, well, I mean, I know your pitfalls, <laughs> and, you know, but we, we both, we, we all have that where we save, where we spend, what our personalities are. And honestly, it's the differences of us as partners and all of us and how we look at where we spend our money. I mean, I love, you know, Dan is much more conservative financially than I am. Like, that's just our nature. Like, it doesn't mean that it's good or bad. But it's interesting because our balance in that conversation is really interesting as well. And then Seth's almost a little bit more out there. He's like, but he's very in tune with where to spend money for a lot of the pieces that we need. And so like, sometimes I look at it and say to myself, I might be middle of the road between the two of you, but then sometimes I know I'm not. <laughs> so, but you know, it's like, I can really become, I can jump into the spending thing very easily. Dan knows that. Yes. Yes, he can. <laughs> and Dan, <laughs> Dan Dan's ready to go recycle stuff. So <laughs> how can we use this again? So but there is a balance and we all know that because we engage that we engage that in the industry and I think that's something that, you know, when you have when God pairs you with somebody and you you know you talk about your wife. I mean, you guys are you guys are probably perfectly paired, you know, between the spending and not spending. So that's an interesting piece. <laughs> Separate checking accounts done. Separate checking accounts. <laughs> Folks, you're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. If you're listening today and you know your questions are outside the box of estate planning or financial planning or any number of the pieces that we kind of traditionally talk about, don't forget that Brayshaw Financial offers auto, home, and business insurance. And we have an entire department that handles all of that for you. Give us a call at 855 226 8551 and be happy to take care of those needs for you or email us at info at your money on tap.com. More money on tap in just a moment. Hey folks, Seth Crossman, Brayshaw Financial Group is our company and we bring to you money on tap. I say we, that's Ben and I. We have a lot of fun doing this show. And one of the things that we love about doing money on tap is that our goal for you to have access to the financial planning world. How do we think? What are we doing? What are we talking about? Raising the bar of your financial education. It's it's so critical. And that's what we're doing here. The other side of this is as well, we're financial planners. If you are looking to work with a financial planner, if you want to have that playbook for you, 
to understand the important things right now and how you're going to get to your goals or how you're going to retire successfully. That's what we're doing as well. If you have $250,000 of investable assets, give us a call. It's free to you and it is worth your time to pick up that phone and give us a call and discover what complete wealth management looks like. Ben and I are excited about the opportunity to partner with you and give you that financial plan that's going to make the next step so much better understood and get you where you need to go. This is the best of Money on Tap. And in our next conversation, an important piece of information about Social Security and taxes and how you can better structure your finances to avoid being overtaxed. We know that we talk about taxes. We talk about financial planning and it's, and it's just, it's the, it is what it is. You know, when I, and what I say by what I mean by that is if you have income, you probably have taxes you probably live somewhere and we got to try to understand this stuff. And one of the things that most people just don't even really understand around how income and retirement income and taxes work is that they probably are paying taxes on their social security. Or if you do understand that, you may not realize that there's some ways to put your income together differently to affect the taxes that you're getting taken out of from those social security benefits. And that's what the show is about. And there are going to be numbers involved. <laughs> there's going to be, um, there's going to be, uh, uh, some some of the part of this that might just be a little drier than other, but but it is the cake that we bake. You know, at the end of it, we want to put this thing together in a way for you that uh, that really allows you to have control over the product, out over the outcome um, of your income, and that income really can mean a big difference from you know um, a, a lot of decisions that you make all the time. You know, Seth. You know, one of the things about preparing income is just how much you get to keep. I mean, that's what people really are. That's the conversation a lot of people don't really understand how to communicate to financial people or CPAs is like, I just want to keep more. This is how much you need to keep. I, I tell you, people come in on, in the office and they say, you know, this is how much income I need. And I'm like, is that how much you need to keep or is that how much you need to make? Because you don't know how they're calculating it. Everyone's looking at it differently. And you'd think most of them are like, well, I need, you know, $50,000 to live off of. Well, that's one way of communicating it, but you still don't know if they're calculating their taxes in that. And so we have to have that clear conversation. And invariably, every one of the people who are really entering retirement right now are absolutely considering that Social Security is a primary provider for their retirement. I would say that people in our, you know, 25-year-old age bracket don't consider Social Security as, uh, as, the, uh, as even a possibility, right? So us 20-year-olds, we're out there, we're saying, hey, listen, Social Security is not going to be there for us. And uh, folks, I'm just kidding, we're not in our 20s. But, uh, but that's, that's really, there's a big disparity between ages of who thinks Social Security is going to play that primary role or be an instrumental part in their retirement and, and who doesn't think that. And everybody in between has some variable of that. I mean, I honestly got to tell you, I'm not sure that Social Security is going to play much, if any, role in my retirement. I just don't think so. I, I mean, I, I'm not preparing for that. I, I mean, the clients I work with in our age bracket, I, I, I communicate that. I, I'm not sure. I, I mean, I know it's by the you know claims paying ability of the U.S. government and yada, 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 but... In, my last Social Security statement that they mailed to me, which was forever ago, said in 2034 they were going to run out of money in Social Security. So to me, that tells me they're going to run out before I retired. So those are the kinds of things that I'm concerned about. And I look at the hundred and some odd trillion dollars of, you know, un, basically unrealized, you know, expenses we have coming as something that we're not really sure that our government's going to be able to pay. And that makes a big deal. So in the early years, it's important to see how you can maximize your income. And, and that really brings in a lot of different issues when it comes to Social Security, because there are people out there, and Seth, you've seen it a zillion times, where they say, hey, listen, why? I think it's line, I don't know if it's 17 or 18 or 19 on your, 
you ta- your 1040, but it says, hey, this is, this is your social security. It's kind of in the middle of the page. And then to the right, if it has a number written in there, it's a, it's a percentage of that social security or it's, there's nothing there. And if they're, if they're bringing that number all the way over to the right, that means that's getting added back into your income to be taxable. And people say, hey, wait, wait, I, I wasn't planning on, I, I'm in full retirement age. I thought I could make anything I want and, uh, you know, and like all the stuff. And it's just not the case. It's just not the case. I, I mean, I feel like my hands are tied here, right? When we, when we just talk about this, because it's like, what am I going to do? I mean, as, as far as, you know, how to uh, adjust my gross income or, you know, gosh, I, I mean, because that's, that's not a goal I have to lower my income. Um, you know, what are some of the other things that I can do to try to lower my taxes or, or try to move this number one direction or another? Well, um, you know, some of the factors that, that, that people don't, or, I mean, don't realize early on is that, um, you know, they have the ability to kind of convert where their money is. You can move money from one place to another. And depending on where you're at, and, and this is much more preferable for a lot of people to be doing this planning work ahead of time, uh, to be able to maybe pay taxes where they're at right now and may, maybe move some money into another direction where it won't be seen as a taxable or a line item affecting that social security tax. And what do I mean by that? Well, Seth, uh, what I, I'm talking to myself right here, folks. Um, <laughs> what I mean by that <laughs> is I'm talking about taking, for instance, <clears throat> ordinary income that were what would be considered ordinary income in your retirement, which would be your IRA money. Okay, take that IRA money that you're collecting right now or that 401k money that you're collecting right now and try to put it into a tax advantaged retirement account like a Roth IRA. And there's other places to put this as well. It's just one of them that, you know, shows up for us or people, you know, for the most part, we all kind of get that. And some 401ks have that option within the 401k to move those monies over to the Roth. So what is that going to do? Well, what that's going to do is, for one, it's going to create some taxability right now in your current, uh, in this current year. And uh, and paying the taxes right now will then create, well, basically that money will go over into the Roth where you won't have to account for that as income towards your social security. You know, Seth, you make a great point about the Roth because the Roth comes to you as tax-free income. And I, I think that's really good. But people are like, well, why is that important? When, when do I become vulnerable? When, when is my income issue a, a problem when it comes to social security? And it's probably going to shock a lot of people here um, that are listening because, you know, basically your social security starts getting added back in when your gross income, including social security, is at least $25,000. Now, for a lot of people, they're easily crossing that number with Social Security. And then we have this whole mass. So it's $25,000 for couples filing jointly with a 50% calculation of adding Social Security over. And um, for married filing jointly, it's like 32000 But they add 85% of your Social Security benefits in to be taxable when your individual income is 34000 and your gross joint income is over 44,000. So let me back up. There's a lot of numbers. So basically you're telling me, Ben, that somewhere between 2,000 and 1,500 bucks a month of income for me makes my social security benefits taxable. And I'm saying, yeah, roughly, yes, you need to start having a conversation with your tax person. That's a 50% level. Now, if you're making somewhere between 3,000 and almost $4,000 a month in income, about 85% of your social security benefits are going to be added back in to be taxable. That's a big deal. Now there's a lot of things that people don't understand about this because it's not just like, Hey, I work this side job. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. They're adding all sorts of income in. They're even adding in and, and, and I want everyone to listen very carefully because this is one of the things that is just kind of like, I feel like it's a kick in the teeth. This is that one item, that one nugget that everyone's like, really? And this is where they add in 
those muni bonds, you know, those things that people say, hey, buy these municipal bonds, get some tax-free income, you know, and, you know, whether it's state or federal, you know, whatever, irrelevant of it. It's like, hey. hey I saw an advertisement for that just the other day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people are always advertising these tax-free bonds. Well, they are tax-free, but the income from those municipal bonds is added back in to do the calculation of whether or not they bring your Social Security in to be taxed. And this is a big, big deal because a lot of people say, oh, I mean, I've met financial advisor after financial advisor who has shoved people into large tax-free bond options to basically give the client tax-free income. And then all of a sudden their social security starts getting added back in and you're like, what the, why aren't people educating on this? And it's because they just don't know it. And so if you, uh, you know, have a lot of tax-free bonds and that's pri- part of your primary goal, go check that. I can't remember if it's line 17, 18, 19. I- I'll have to check that out. But if you have a question, give us a call. You can bring your tax return in. I can tell you in two minutes, first page, whether or not you're paying taxes on Social Security. And a sit-down meeting in probably an hour can figure out whether or not, you know, we can try to get that number down or reduce your taxes or restructure because there's lots of opportunities. And Seth, you know, you bring up a Roth and I think that's where planning comes into place. We talk to people all the time and you know, they don't want to they don't want to pay an advisor to do their work and they don't want, you know, they they they've been educated that fees and expenses and commissions and all this stuff they're just bad. They're all bad. Well, if you're not getting anything for it, I would say you're overpaying. <laughs> I would say it's not bad. And yeah, am I biased? Is that how we get compensated? Absolutely. That's who we are. But if you are paying an advisor to provide you income as much as they possibly can, and they don't know these simple moves to help you, that's how we pay for our services. We bring value to the table. And so that's one of the things where I think a lot of people here, listen, if you own muni muni bonds, you need to really be aware of this because that is going to impact your Social Security and whether it's taxed. Thank you for joining us today for the best of Money on Tap. We saw some stark changes in business practices when our world was turned upside down with COVID. Many financial advisors were staying home, and many are still staying home when they conduct business. In this segment, Ben and Seth discuss the adverse effect this can have in serving their clients. We are talking about where was your advisor when? And you can fill in the blank there on that. There's certainly a lot of opportunity. And uh, as financial planners and financial advisors here at Brayshaw Financial Group, um, you know, there's ways that we take a look at ourselves and say, gosh, I wish I could have or I could have shown up differently in that situation. We're just human beings, right? But there's also that question that runs throughout our practice that has created an environment here that is probably very different than what most people experience working with financial planners. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, but I think, first of all, there was an article that Ben found. And I do like the – Ben, I appreciate you giving me credit on the article that I found about Richard Branson and that you liked it. I'll go ahead and give you the same back. I really like this article. I'm glad what you found here. <laughs> well, this was just in a Financial Advisor magazine. I just thought it was interesting. But uh, you're welcome, Seth. And yeah. uh, thank you in return. Um, yeah. It was just interesting, and I I think this is what really kind of got me. You know, we were talking about shows, and I just said, you know, there's there's there are differences between financial advisors. There's there's investment differences. There's personality differences. There's strategic differences. There's you know types of investing that people do or don't do. We're going to talk a little bit about the different types of advisors. We are three dimensional advisors, as we call ourselves, because we work in brokerage fee based and the insurance realms. We bring all of those together, which is not necessarily a uh, a common piece to the uh, to the story. But when it really comes to um, where you stand in commitment, I think that's there's something to be said to that. And you know, one thing that we have done here, and, and we talked about it earlier in the show, was we decided as a group to remain 100% open. We had been given, um, you know, <clears throat> the letter by, by the Department of Treasury, a basically a get out of jail free card. We could go travel anywhere we needed to do. We, we, we ha- run a compliance portion to our, our company where we oversee other financial advisors. So we have a lot of uh, infrastructure here that we have to maintain and, and uh, adhere to. And so when we sat down, we had this conversation, you know, we really broke it down and said, you know, we cannot accomplish or meet the goals of our clients remotely as well as we can 
here at our office with the tools, the information, the structure, the files, everything. It, everything would be delayed. Our the, the process to get anyone's information done. Um, yeah, we could do transactions, but could we do them as well? Can we have our meetings? Can we can we do all the pieces we need to do if we are not here at our office? And when we came down to the fact that it just isn't possible that everyone would lose on some form or fashion if we went 100% remote. And, you know, it's interesting is because I think every listener knows that 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 exists on some level. I mean, I think we all intrinsically know that, you know, not as much work gets done. You get distracted. Kids are running. Can you get your work done? Yes. But our trading realm is between 930 and 4. If the child runs in the room at 350 and I'm trying to get a trade through and that doesn't happen that day, that's an impact that is time sensitive. So we have so many time sensitive things in our world that remoteness we knew would jeopardize some of that stuff. In this industry, you know, more than most, you know, time is money. You know, in that example you just shared, I mean, one trade day to the next, if you miss execution, there's a good chance you just cost somebody something. And yeah. that's that's the kind of reality that, you know, we just felt we just couldn't allow to creep into the practice. That's just not the way we do business. Yeah, and then this first article that Seth was referencing was, it, it had a statement in it. It's it's thirty four percent of wirehouse advisors say their firm stumbled during the pandemic. That's wirehouses. We're not wirehouse um, advisors. We are independent advisors. We work we work for ourselves. We work with an independent broker dealer, and you know people don't tell us what to sell. We don't. We're not employees for another firm. Um, but thirty four percent of wirehouse advisors reported reduced levels of support from the home office, and 29% cited disruption of business services, the study said. Wirehouse respondents said they experienced these negative effects at about double the rate of non-wirehouse and independent advisors. So the independent advisor space was significantly less interrupted in general. Um, so if you're working with a wirehouse, you probably experience some of those problems because they're, they're well known. If you are one of the lucky ones, that's great. I'm glad that worked out for you. Um, but this is the real deal. Like, what is going on? And why is this such a big deal? Because what I have found is that advisors are still not back to the office. I mean, I, I literally know hundreds and hundreds of advisors who, you know, we meet at, you know, this, that. Oh, listen, I went to, a, I went to a, a CE thing that had a golf thing in the afternoon. Uh, it was great. I had to go to the CE. It was one of the things I needed That's to continuing do. Continuing education for continuing for education. Those. Yeah. You know what? <laughs> Almost every one of them was working for their house, and I was like, "Oh well, we never closed." I'm like, "How did you do that? How? I mean, there's no way. I really don't think there's any way you can provide the level of service and competency and response time in a remote environment in the financial world. I mean, we're, we're so you know dependent on our assistance and, and the help that we have in our office, and you know the vast difference between getting up from your desk, walking down the hall and grabbing someone's attention versus sending a text, making a call, sending an email, wondering who's where. And, and just, this just the simple human connection to relay instructions, you know, face to face versus leveraging technology. It's, it's, it's just incredible. Well, I think it's funny too, that, you know, we, like, we didn't just have a normal environment. Like it wasn't like, Hey, everyone's getting their coffee at the thing we had. We had all our staff, we had all our kids in here. I mean, we literally hosted a classroom. We have classroom seating in one of our conference rooms, and we had kids in there. We had the parents rotating in and out, teaching their kids. I mean, we've talked about it and joked around about it on the show a couple times, but in reality, that's exactly what we did. I mean, I literally know all of our employees' kids by first name. I mean, yeah. it, I, they come in, they want to talk to me. spent a year with them. I so. spent a year with these kids. You know, I mean, I know these kids. They're my family, you know. like I don't, You're Uncle Ben now. Yeah, I'm Uncle Ben. <laughs> this is the best of Money on Tap, and we appreciate you joining us today. In our last segment, Ben and Seth look at some important tools in our investments, mutual funds and ETFs. We're going to talk about these instruments. We're going to talk about the reasons why. Uh, and then you know what? There's 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 all sorts of tools to be using for your investment, and uh, a couple of them that we're going to bring to the table today just happen to be mutual funds and ETFs. Yeah, you know, there's a lot. I mean, we've talked a little bit about in the beginning of the show, but there's a lot of conversation. There's a there's scuttlebutt everywhere about ETFs, and there's no question that there's something going on. And 
you know, when we, when we see things happening in the marketplace, it's usually in response or reaction to something that's driving that. And I think that's really where we want to dig in. I want to dig into, you know, why are people prying out this ETF conversation more and more? And I mean, ETFs are, you know, newer on the spectrum than kind of the mutual fund conversation. Talk a little bit about some of the general generalities of the differences here, but not in too much specifics, but give you enough to try to understand where they're going and, and why this is happening. And, you know, it may be right for you. It may not be. That's not really the, the point of this show today for to give you information on making a decision on buying one or the other. But I will tell you that there's reasons for why there is a lot of movement here. And um, I'm looking forward to kind of digging into that and bringing some awareness to where this is going to go as we as we move forward because there's a lot around this. Yeah, it seems like it's it's more and more a hot topic. But ETFs have been around since the '90s. You know, the, I think the first one created was up in Toronto in 1990, and, and the first one publicly traded in the U.S. goes back to '93. So they've been around quite a bit of time. But day by day, article by article, more and more, uh, they come up in in the mainstream media and in conversation with clients. And the, the, the question kind of comes back to also frequently, you know, what's really the difference between that and a mutual fund? They both look like a bundle of investments, you know, a, a basket full of stocks. So what is the difference? And I think, you know, I want to say, first of all, we just don't give enough credit to those Canucks for, you know, being uh, what they are. I mean, innovators, they're innovators. Right? <laughs> innovators. I mean, what else are you going to do? You're up there in the – well, you guys are in the freezing cold as well. But, well, they convinced us to fight all their wars. So whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. They're smart. So, um yeah, no, I mean I think from a from a disclosure standpoint, uh, I mean we use mutual funds and ETFs here. I mean we use them in our managed platforms, we use them in different various forms. And I, I don't think that we have a necessary uh, preference to one or the other. I mean we really look at value concepts of where we think money would be best suited and then we look at the over you know, open architecture of what we can invest in. And when we choose those, sometimes we choose baskets of equities. We buy straight up stocks. I mean, however we can accomplish what our goal is. I mean, I think about our one, you know, large mid-cap value portfolio that we have, which is, you know, just 25 stocks. It's 25 stocks we use, we rotate. It's it's that. It's not a fund. It's not a mutual fund. It's not an ETF. It is yeah. straight chosen equities by us. And then- Well, it is, but, but how we choose them is really interesting, though. We should probably- do a little video on that because the uh, the spinning wheel of large cap uh, value stocks out there that we throw on the board and then we just start throwing darts on it while it starts spinning <laughs> that is so much fun so much fun even better it's when you week blindfold to week. it too yeah oh oh I, and Ben you know runs through and we get a I try to get know, set get the whole board up it. yeah it's, it's oh fun. It's I did fun. that one time that was it. No more. Yeah, no, we have we have some internal architecture around our, our choosing of equities in that space. And um, we use that for a specific type of client to specific type of play. But we very much use ETFs and mutual funds as well in a, in a very, you know, different capacity, but also in managing money for our client base. So so let's get into the conversation around, you know, kind of some general differences about mutual funds and ETFs. And I think I probably want to first start off with, you know, what do they, what is, what is a mutual fund? What is an ETF? You know, I mean, really what, when you actually break it down, they're both culminations of stocks. They both have or bonds and bonds. Well, if you have a bond fund, right? So that's not right. a mutual fund. So a bond fund would be a culmination of bonds. You know, the, the loans made to companies. Stocks are when you own an equity position and you're an owner in a company. Now, when you own a mutual fund, you know, traditionally there's a whole bunch of stocks in, inside there. There could be a thousand, it could be 5,000 stocks. They own a little bit of each here and there. And it could be that you have a growth or a value based, or it's a large or a mid or small cap kind of mutual fund. And, and those are based on specific areas of development, right? So you're looking at trying to either create growth or get exposure to the small investment, you know, the small business world or the mid business world or the larger blue chip business world. Maybe you're looking for a growth fund or a value, you know, you're looking for yield or that's where that is. Where the ETF space plays, it's a little different is it's a smaller basket of stocks. It's 50, it's a hundred stocks that are underlying and they're all usually domain specific, right? So if you bought a gold based ETF. And I'm not promoting gold, but it would have a gold miner, a gold refiner, a gold, you know, whatever, 
uh, transporter, but it would all be associated with that domain, uh, a sector of some sort, you know, and it would it would be focused on that. Like if you wanted to, so you can buy commodities, basically, is what you're saying. You can you can have commodity ETFs. Yeah, you can have you can, you, have, you can have anything that you want in a specific sector and go find that. If you want a technology based ETF, it might look and smell more like a, a mutual fund mix, but it'd be technology only, and and so. Yeah. You know, you really have to understand how they play. So people who invest in sectors, okay, they go usually ETF, or that's been kind of the recent theme, right? And if if you want to be generalities in, in the whole marketplace and you don't really care if you own McDonald's and, you know, Microsoft in the same investment, even though they have no parallel correlation at all, then you're going to find that more that kind of investing style more in a in a mutual fund. You know, and so that's that's really the yeah, overall. I think that the ETF is is more rules based. Yeah. You know, it's it's set out to track a specific sector or a specific industry, and and that's the goal of how it accumulates stocks. They have to be focused based upon whatever that pre selected sector is. Whereas a mutual fund, there's generally a little bit more discretion in the hands of the manager to pick and choose stocks within a somewhat yeah. defined realm, but. A lot more discretion there. Yeah, and you can find all those rules to any one of those things that you own in the prospectus that you should absolutely ask for and, you know, will be delivered to you upon, you know, opening an account with, with us anyways. So, you know, those are the types of things that we're doing. But but there has been this kind of overwhelming conversation in the industry. And I'm just thinking about, you know, Seth, you, if you want to just jump in on that Dimensional Funds article, I think that's really a very interesting piece that kind of triggered this whole conversation. Yeah, happy to do that. Really, the the what has happened when we were talking about a massive move in um, the industry right now is is a company that is uh, called Dimensional Fund Advisors, uh, typically a mutual fund company. That's how they they predominantly warehouse their investments, and for the most part, to even have access into these DFA or Dimensional Fund Advisors uh, uh, pools of money or investments, you really have to work with a, an advisor that's, that's kind of, they have like a certification that they go through to work with these DFA uh, funds. So what is what has happened there is they've had pretty much everything that they're working with in mostly like a passive type of a uh, allocation. And they're really like using laws of large numbers, some really interesting math around why and how they allocate. But they've been his, historically, kind of losing out on the tax advantaged uh, ETF. They've been using tax advantaged mutual funds, but the mutual fund, the way a mutual fund is set up, is not the the it's it's just doesn't work as well for non qualified accounts for the most part. Even though their turnover in their mutual funds was designed to be very low, creating a very low tax scenario for those non qualified monies. They've made a decision with six, four of their their funds to um, move them over into an ETF wrapper, and yeah. it's ultimately what this is doing is it is opening them up to a public marketplace, uh, and out of that DFA, uh, you know, holding where they've been uh, only been able to be used by the DFA advisors. Yeah, I think this is really very interesting because, you know, DFA used in a lot of retirement plans. Um, throughout the country, it just, you know, none of this tax issue even matters. So if you own dimensional funds or you have a mutual fund out there and it's, it's sitting in your 401k or your SEP or your IRA or something like that, if you have some exposure to that, you know, this tax scenario means nothing. So, you know, a lot of the hoopla is attracting attention for people in areas that it doesn't really mean anything. I mean, there's, there's no tax advantage Either way, like it doesn't matter if you own an ETF or a mutual fund in your re- retirement plan. It's IRA, 401k, SEP, simple, Keo, all retirement you know, funds. Anything you're going to, any retirement plan you could possibly dream of, it's not going to matter. You've been listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. We've uh, enjoyed the show today. We've been grateful for you for joining us. We thank you for calling us and giving us an opportunity to speak into your life and be trusted advisors with you. That's something we we hold really sacred, and um, we 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 want to appreciate you for that. So thank you so much. And we just also 
want to appreciate you for allowing us to be who we are and have fun with what we do on a daily basis, which is financial planning. You can also find us at Facebook. We're at backslash 3D investing. We're also on Twitter at BFG underscore LLC. And as always, you can also find us at yourmoneyontap.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for liking our podcast. We appreciate you and we can't wait to make it a great day and a great life with you here at Money on Tap. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of this radio station and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. No strategy, product, material, or tool mentioned can assure a profit nor protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information, products, materials, or tools mentioned should be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. This show may be subsidized in whole or in part by a product sponsor or issuer. Securities and advisory services offered through Sage Point Financial Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC, and a registered investment advisor. All other services offered through Brayshaw Financial Group LLC are independent of Sage Point Financial. Sage Point Financial and Brayshaw Financial Group do not provide tax or legal advice. Main office is located at 116 South River Road, Bedford, New Hampshire. 03110 and can be reached at toll free 855 226 8551.